All right, these are notes for the, let me figure out how to resume my slideshow. Um, notes on steps to World War II for U.S. honors. So looking at things from the U.S. point of view. And give me one sec. There it is. All right. So um, just some worldwide context before we start. So we have the end of World War I in 1919, which led to a lot of international instability as all of the new nations in Europe have to figure out how to govern. Um, Germany is going to attempt a democracy called the Weimar Republic after having been a monarchy for a long time. Um, we also have the Roaring Twenties happening, uh, mainly in the US, but also um, to some extent in Europe, not as much in Germany. Um, because of the worldwide economic depression and the collapse of the international financial system, which leads to massive unemployment and poverty worldwide. Um, it actually starts in the 1920s for Germany, um, and it gets to about 75% unemployment in Germany. So if you think about you have a group of four friends, three of you are unemployed and looking for work, and one is employed and probably underemployed. Um, Germany is still trying to pay reparations throughout the 1920s, um, the U.S. is pretty isolated during this time period, so we're not hugely involved in the rest of the world. We have the spread of communism from the Soviet Union, um, which changed from Russia to the Soviet Union after the Bolshevik Revolution in the middle of World War I, um, and that leads to a lot of fear and the rise of the far right, which is the rise of dictators and the authoritarian regimes that we see and we're going to talk about um, forming in a bunch of these nations. We did form the League of Nations um, at the end of World War I, um, but that's going to be um, really weak, especially because the United States never joins it and um, is really unable to um, make a lot of changes and um, really help prevent the coming of World War II. So um, our dictators um, are going to, the first to rise is going to be, well, he's not actually the first to rise, um, but the most prominent throughout this era um, is going to be Adolf Hitler, who seizes power in 1933 by declaring himself Chancellor of Germany. He is a member of the Nationalist Socialist German Workers Party, also known by their it's a, their abbreviation, the Nazi Party. Um, they blame the Jews for the destruction of the German government and all of the economic problems that result from World War One, as well as from the economic collapse worldwide. Um, he is going to imprison all of his critics. Um, the Jews are going to lose their rights. He promises to bring prosperity to Germany and actually comes through um, using a lot of the techniques that FDR does, which is a lot of um, stimulus spending. Um, so many governments throughout the world and world history have used stimulus spending to help um, promote. So the Nazis are the ones that build the Autobahn, the highways um, in Germany so that they can move military equipment. And he practices totalitarian rule, where the government has total control of every aspect of life in a nation. Um, so he, as he calls himself the Fuhrer, he um, essentially is um, the incomplete control of um, every decision in Germany um, to a very high extent. Um, in Italy, Benito Mussolini is going to rise. Um, he becomes the prime minister of Italy and then basically takes control from there. Um, he promises to build a new Roman Empire for Italy. Uh, he's very successful in improving the economy and bringing stability to the country, again, through stimulus payments and things like that. Um, he is nicknamed Il Duce um, and is credited with the remilitarization of Italy. And he is a fascist, um, like Hitler. Um, where the government rules through terror and appeals to nationalism and racism. So both Hitler and Mussolini are going to be fascists and totalitarian. Good vocab words to know for this unit. On the other side of the world, in Japan, we have Hideki Tojo, who rises. Um, <clears throat> there is still an emperor in Japan. <coughs> Um, but Tojo is one of the radical military leaders who takes control. Um, he becomes prime minister eventually. Um, in their search for raw goods and materials, Japan then conquers Korea and part of China, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, he wants to extend Japanese power into China and all of Southeastern Asia in order to get raw goods and materials and really expand the military um, power of Japan. And he is the prime minister who orders the attack on Pearl Harbor. 
Over in the Soviet Union, we have Stalin, Joseph Stalin, um, who is the communist dictator of the Soviet Union, and he is also totalitarian, um, has complete control of the country and the state. Um, he is not as much of a fascist as the others, um, but he definitely is probably the most totalitarian of all of them. So just, just a little background um, on them. So in the 1930s, the U.S. is going to respond through isolationism, okay? Um, we renew our policy of neutrality. We focus on internal affairs and leave European nations alone. And you can actually see this in one of the cartoons from um, Dr. Seuss, um, where you can see the American bird um, say, ho hum, when he's finished pecking down that last tree, he'll quite likely be tired. Um, how we have um, this cartoon shows he's, uh, Czechoslovakia has fallen, Greece, Norway, Denmark, Holland, France, Poland, and he's pecking at England of the Nazi bird. Um, and just kind of shows the American attitude towards what's happening, what's going to happen in Europe that we're going to talk about. You can also see it in this Dr. Seuss cartoon. Um, said a bird in the midst of a blitz. Up to now, they've scored very few hits. So I'll sit on my canny old star-spangled fanny, and on it he sits and he sits. So there are a bunch of Dr. Seuss cartoons. Um, Dr. Seuss really gets his um, uh, start with these political cartoons of World War II before he starts doing children cartoons. Um, and so, Dr. S um, not Dr. Seuss, but uh, Mr. America says, what a lucky thing we've got separate beds because everything is happening over in Europe of fascist fever and Nazi fever and Blitzpots and Hitleritis and Stalinich and Italian mumps and ho-hum, no chance of contagion. And then, um, of course, the, the bird um, of I am part Jewish, um, public notice this bird is possessed of an evil demon. And this is really critiquing two of the heavy isolationists um, in the United States, um, Charles Lindbergh and Gerald P. Nye, who want us to stay completely out and take no responsibility. So um, what really, where it starts is with Japanese aggression, um, where in 1910 Jap Japan invades Korea, and this is, you know, even before World War I, um, and then after World War I, Japan invades Manchuria. Manchuria is an area that is north of Korea, today it is part of China, and um, it ha is known for its coal reserves, um, which coal, again, is used to power not only railroads, but also steamships. Um, for the Navy. And so um, Japan is going to invade Manchuria and take that over, and the League of Nations really does nothing. Then Japan is going to attack China um, in 1937, and the League of Nations really does nothing. Um, the United States kind of wags its finger at China or at Japan, but does nothing else. Um, and then in 1940, they sign their peace treaty with Germany and Italy and really become the Axis powers that we talk about today. Um, and Japan then attacks the United States in 1941, and that starts the U.S. involvement in World War II. What's happening back over in Europe um, is Hitler is going to start violating the Treaty of Versailles. The first thing he's going to do is remilitarize the Rhineland. The Rhineland is an area between France and Germany, kind of along the border, um, stretching up into Belgium. And that is going to um, be an area that, per the Treaty of Versailles, had to be demilitarized. No military, no weapons. Um, and Hitler actually marches a bunch of soldiers in with black painted sticks. Um, and France and the League of Nations do nothing. So Hitler says, hey, there was no consequence. I didn't get my hand smacked. And so he is going to begin Anschluss which in 1938, he marches into Austria unopposed and takes over, like you can see on the map. He claims that um, the Austrians and the Germans want Lebensstrom, which means living space, so they just need a little bit more wiggle room to help the Germans, um, you know, most of the Austrians speak German anyways, and so, you know, they just, they're cousins and they want to come back home. And so that's kind of his excuse to the world, and the League of Nations does nothing. So here you can see the map of um, Germany and the Rhineland up here, and then a region called Alsace-Lorraine that's owned by France at this point, and that's the Rhineland was supposed to be demilitarized. 
So the next way that Hitler then violates the treaty is um, when uh, Germany marches into the Sudetenland, which is this area in orange where there are over three million German-speaking people who live in the Sudetenland. Um, and they claim that they are being harassed by the Czechoslovakians, which we now know was not true. The Germans had actually sent in like undercover spies to um, make it seem like the German people, German speaking people living in the Sudetenland were being harassed basically by spies of Germany. Um, so it gives them a reason to march into the Sudetenland. In response to this, apparently Austria wasn't a big deal, but Czechoslovakia, the Sudetenland, is going to be a big deal because Britain and France call together um, the Germans to the Munich conference. They meet in Munich, Germany, and um, so Deladier and Chamberlain and Hitler all meet, and Hitler says, oh, no, 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 it's my last territorial demand. We are not going to do anything else, and so Britain and France say, okay, Mr. Hitler, like, that's going to be your last thing that you ask for? Fine. Um, we are not going to um, do anything else, okay? And so that's an aversion of, or that's an example of appeasement, where you give in to your principles to pacify an aggressor, and you just keep letting him be aggressive and more aggressive and more aggressive and kind of roll over backwards. A year later, Hitler has been communicating with Stalin in secret, and it comes out that they sign a um, non-aggression pact um, and as part of that non-aggression pact that is announced to the world, they have a secret part of it that they are going to attack Poland and split it in half. Because if I go back to the map, this bit over here is Russia. So Poland is between Russia and Germany, and um, Poland is one of those places that has a country and then doesn't have a country and then has a country and then doesn't have a country. Um, and so Germany and Hitler both, um, sorry, Germany and and Russia both want Poland um, as part of their territory. And you can see the political cartoons really mocking um, Germany and Poland and their aggression pack. So the immediate cause of the war, the spark of the war in Europe, is when on September 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland in a, using a blitzkrieg tactic um, called a lightning war. Uh, where they bombed by the planes, they attacked with tanks with overwhelming force, um, and in response for the attack on Poland, Britain and France declare war on Germany. And then just like in World War I, where we had um, all of the alliances pulling different people, different groups in, we're going to see the same thing happen in um, uh, World War II. So, by 1941, um, we have a phony war that has happened where France and Britain hide out on what's called the Maginot Line, which is that yellow line on the map down here. And um, Germany hides on what's called the Siegfried Line, and Stalin is going to annex all these Baltic states that had been created, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, created after World War I. Hitler is going to occupy Denmark and Norway. Um, and things are just kind of sitting. France is, um, had built the Maginot Line after World War I to prevent Germany from ever attacking again. It's a big bunch of concrete bunkers. And um, they're like, we're safe. Nothing's going to happen because it stops right here around the middle of Belgium. But not a problem, okay, because this part down here is mountains. And this part up here is Belgium. And Germany's not going to invade Belgium. So problem solved. However... <laughs> Germany does the exact thing that Hitler, or that France, thought it wouldn't, um, and goes through Belgium through a um, beautiful place called the Ardennes Forest, um, and basically walks around the Maginot Line. Um, and it pushes the French troops all the way up to Dunkirk, which is a great movie um, up here, uh, which is one of the largest uh, evacuation sites. Uh, massive rescue by the English, where they basically say, anyone with a boat, please come and pick up soldiers. Um, and Hitler basically gives the British 24 hours, and when he wakes up 24 hours later, he finds out that there are no soldiers left on the beaches of France. Um, also, during this year, 19, at the end of 1939 and 1940, Italy surrenders, um, or Italy enters the war on Germany's side, and then in 1940, Paris surrenders, um, and Hitler goes and actually marches down the Champs-Élysées um, and takes pictures with the Eiffel Tower and 
um, France is split into an occupied zone and a free zone, which basically has, um, it's called Vichy France, has a puppet Nazi government headed by Marshal, um, headed by Marshal Patain, I think. Um, and of course, Italy occupies a bit of it. And um, you can see on the map kind of what spots are given to which. So in 1941, Germany has taken over. Um, they basically left a little bit of Poland to Poland, but they are pu the puppet government. Um, the Soviet Union has taken over all of these states. Germany has taken over all of these states. Um, Sweden is neutral. Um, the uh, United Kingdom is basically the only one left, um, as France has been occupied as well um, here in yellow. And then um, Vichy France is supporting um, Germany, but then Spain is neutral, um, but they're also kind of supporting Germany. And so it just looks like, um, and these are of course allies, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, Yugoslavia are all allies of um, Germany. So that's where we are in 1941. Um, Germany knew that they could not compete with Britain's Navy, um, and Hitler decides that he wants to take over um, Britain next. Um, so they decide to use the Luftwaffe, which is Germany's air force. And their plan is to destroy the British Royal Air Force, or RAF. Um, and uh, unfortunately for the Germans, they didn't know that the British had radar at this point. And so they were able to detect all of these surprise attacks and able to have planes um, British planes already up in the air, which meant that they were they were much less likely um, to be able to destroy the planes. It's a lot easier to bomb and destroy planes when they're on the ground. Um, the Germans bomb a number of British cities. London is bombed for almost a year straight. Um, and you can see the picture of people just going about their daily business with all of these bombed out buildings um, in London on the bottom there. Roosevelt tries to gain support for Britain in the U.S. by claiming that it was fighting to defend these four freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from want, and freedom from fear in one of our, um, his speeches. And Norman Rockwell um, paints these images um, to try and get the Americans to start thinking about, oh, maybe like if Britain falls, then who's left to fight the Germans? Us. And so Roosevelt, being friends with Winston Churchill, who is the Prime Minister of Britain, is starting to really focus on how do we help Britain stand because so that way the, the fire doesn't spread across the Atlantic Ocean to the United States. And so FDR decides to convince Congress to um, do this first program called Cash and Carry. So the British are run, the Allies British, are running out of weapons. And so... Um, FDR says that the Allies could purchase American goods and arms if they pay in cash and they use their own ships for transport. So they want to make sure that it's not American ships being sunk. So if you think back to World War I, what was one of the big causes of um, the U.S. getting involved in World War I was because all of our merchant ships, not military ships, our merchant ships kept getting sunk as we were still trading with Britain. So FDR says, let's limit that, and the British have to use their ships to come, and then we'll continue to supply them, they'll be able to defeat the Germans, and we'll never have to get involved. Well, doesn't work out so well. Sorry, I had to take a sip of water. Because what happens is um, Britain runs out of money, um, and they're running out of ships to send over. And so Roosevelt pushes Congress to pass a law called the Lend-Lease Act um, that will allow the United States to sell, lend, or lease arms or other war materials to warring nations. And so at this point, if we are essentially supplying Britain, are we still neutral? That's a big question to think about. Um, and so you can see in the Dr. Seuss cartoon, it's truly encouraging how much of this stuff drifts into British ports. Okay, from Lend-Lease, two-thirds of the way to England. And that's just a commentary on how the British submarines, similar to World War I, are destroying a bunch of um, uh, military supplies and sending it to the bottom of the ocean. Some things never get to Britain. So then on December 7th, 1941, um, we have the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, a date which will live in infamy, um, as FDR says in his speech to Congress. 
Um, and so uh, we're caught unawares. This is um, ordered and uh, signed off by Prime Minister Tojo over in Japan. Um, and it starts early in the morning. It's a Sunday, so people are pretty complacent and not expecting an attack. And a bunch of our ships, you can see in this image of Pearl Harbor, are just kind of sitting like ducks in a row, um, being prepared. The one benefit for our sakes, for the United States, is that we had a bunch of our ships out um, on maneuvers outside of um, Pearl Harbor. And so luckily those ships were spared. They had been ordered out a week or a week before. Um, and this picture on the right is a picture of the USS Arizona, um, which was um, right here in Pearl Harbor. Um, this peninsula is where the today's um, Memorial Museum is. And then you can take a um, uh, ferry out across um, and stand above the wreckage of the Arizona and what is left. So you can see how many ships we had in um, in port. Here's a picture from one of the Japanese airplanes um, as they were coming in to Pearl Harbor, um, one of the second wave. And here's another image of the destruction. You can see the gun that should be up on top of the ship on top of the water um, is now basically at water level. So the United States lost, I think about 2,000, I didn't look up the number, 2,000 military men in the attack on Pearl Harbor. And this is the event that will cause the United States to declare war on Japan, who is allied with Germany at this point, um, and thus get the United States involved in World War II.